Hey everyone, it's Sam with Wrestling Overtime, and we are doing raves and rants for the WWE Raw on May 18, 2020. Now, this one starts out with Charlie in the ring repeating her line from last week that Edge and Randy Orton might be the greatest wrestling match ever. And I'm still saying, are they really going to run with this? I thought that was something that maybe she just kind of threw out there. And maybe it was, or maybe it was planted, but, I mean, they have a graphic and everything. So I'm thinking that they've decided that they're going to run with this. And it's really weird. Randy says the term straight-up wrestling isn't that hard to understand. Well, it is when Edge and Orton aren't known for straight-up wrestling. They've always been doing other things, stunts, or, or known for their characters that they build. Um, Randy then talks about how he saw doubt in Edge's face. Well, yeah, because I'm sure he was thinking wrestling... Wrestling, what what are you talking about here, Randy? So we hear Edge's music hit, and he comes out. He said he's been thinking, and he knows that Randy is just playing games. He also knows that Randy is the most talented man he's ever seen in a wrestling ring. Edge talks again about how Randy was handed everything. And I was finally glad when Randy told him to shut up and just make a decision. Ed shouted that he accept, and Orton just smirked and basically left. And I am getting tired of Edge bringing up how entitled and privileged that Randy was. Um, yes, he probably was. Yes, he got chances that maybe he didn't earn right away or you know that he maybe didn't deserve but I'm sure that there were times that a lot of people have not just because of their parents but because of their previous work ethic or the amount of money that they brought into the company or or whatever so um, you know that was part of the storyline of Wrestlemania I don't know that necessarily needs to be the storyline right now I think you can um, start a new one. Just not the greatest wrestling match ever. I'm, I'm not sure where they're going with that. Then after commercial, of course, we got uh, Seth Rollins with Buddy Murphy coming out to the ring. And Seth appears to have been enlightened. And he says, sometimes you have to lose who you are in order to find yourself that he felt fell into the darkness after his loss to Drew and without darkness there could be no light and he has seen it because of Rey Mysterio. He said Rey sacrificed himself for the greater good and then looks in the camera and tells Rey that he's welcome. Now, as I've told you guys before, I love this new Seth Rollins. I love the Monday Night Messiah. I love how we're seeing him go up and down on this roller coaster that he's riding. How he is cocky and sure of himself until he gets beat down. And then um, he gets into the depths of despair and realizes something, and then he is back up on the mountain. So I'm enjoying this ride with Seth Rollins. I feel like in the last, I don't know, six months or so, he's been doing some of the best work that I've seen him do with character development and, and everything, and I am enjoying it. I know there's a lot of people out there that love to hate on Seth, and, and that's fine. But I am really enjoying it, and I feel like he is establishing himself as one of this generation's stars. 
Now, Humberto comes out to interrupt him. He says that Ray's a hero and that Seth is a kyer. And as Humberto comes into the ring, of course, Buddy Murphy goes and, and blocks him so that he can't get to Seth. And Seth talks about how he isn't dressed to fight and it looks like Humberto come out to fight so since Murphy is dressed to fight Alistair Black later on then Humberto is welcome to fight Buddy Murphy now so we get a Humberto Carrella versus Murphy with Seth Rollins you know ringside and I'll tell you watching him from before the pandemic started and then watching him in this match I truly feel that Humberto is isn't ready to be on Raw yet he is very young you can see that he is not polished um his moves do, don't flow and I feel like I personally cannot get into his matches because when you compare him to someone like Austin Theory he just doesn't stand up in being polished in who he is, who his character is. But he's not even skilled in, enough as Austin Theory is in the ring. And again, if you can compare him to some of the young AEW stars, Sammy Guevara, uh, MJF, Jungle Boy, he he doesn't compare to them. And I just feel like he's not ready to be on Raw yet. Um, finally, Seth ends up distracting Humberto, and Murphy ends up hitting Murphy's Law for the win. However, Murphy continues the beatdown until Alistair Black comes out, and we see Rollins sliding up the ramp as Buddy Murphy leaves the ring, and, and they go up the ramp together it just feels like we're going to bring back Alistair Black and Buddy Murphy again which I'm not complaining about they had three excellent matches and it caused Buddy Murphy to join Seth, Seth Rollins so that's fine you know but um, I really wish we could mix it up a little then we have Baron Corbin backstage at Raw and he's complaining that he isn't being treated like a, a king should be treated. Uh, you know, he doesn't have his own locker room. People aren't getting him things to drink. And, and we basically just see Baron Corbin being Baron Corbin. Then we get um, Lev Morgan talking about how her mom is her hero. And how... They never really had any money, but her mom never quit. Two weeks ago, she lost to Charlotte Flair, and she looks right in the camera and says that she's not going to quit, that she will be women's champion one day. And I kind of do believe that. Number one, I believe that WWE, if you stay with them, uh, they reward loyalty and you know, they will give her a championship. But number two, I think Liv Morgan from coming back from her injuries and, and really working and her being as young as she is, is willing to learn. And I think that she will get better. She just needs to be given time. Charlotte is on Raw again, and she comes out to talk about her match with Bailey. But then... She all of a sudden calls out Ruby Riot. She says that she hears that Ruby Riot has some things that she wants to talk about. And that leads to Charlotte Flair versus Ruby Riot. This match isn't interesting whatsoever. It ends up being a beatdown by Charlotte. She even talks trash to Liv Morgan while attacking Ruby. Now Charlotte finally ends it with a figure eight and Ruby Riot tapped, 
But I guess what I'm disappointed in in this match is the fact that Ruby Riot didn't really get any offense going, didn't really show any skills, and it just looks like she's fell down the WWE ladder even further since coming back from her double shoulder surgery. And I don't know what it's going to take for her to really revive her character and get herself going in the WWE. Then we see Bobby Lashley and MVP are backstage. MVP says that Lashley is too focused on fighting clowns and his wife. And he asked Lashley what would happen if he got the full Nelson on a WWE champion. And this looks like it makes Bobby Lashley think. However, I don't know that I agree. Um, I don't know that Bobby Lashley is, is that developed of a character that he can think about things. I agree with MVP that when they first brought Lashley back, he was uh, focused on fighting clowns and everything. But now I feel like he has to in order to build himself up as a monster. And I guess he is going to be um, Drew McIntyre's next victim, the next program that they're going to do, and it's just not that interesting. And I don't know that MVP is the mouthpiece that's going to make it that interesting. It does, however, look like they're clarifying MVP's role a little more that he is going to be a business advisor and, and manager to Bobby Lashley. Then we have to get the ridiculousness of the whole show started because, you know, we're, we're into this and we haven't had any stupidity going on. And I know some of you would say, oh, it's comedy. No, it's bad. Um, the street prophets are walking through the woods, basically. And they are talking about how they're meeting the Viking Raiders and going to have an axe throwing contest. They come upon this um, camp that the Viking Raiders have set up with, I guess, their their friends or, or uh, their other Vikings, I'm not sure. And this just looks like a, an excuse for them to dress up in costumes. Uh, it's it's really getting ridiculous. Them being in a minivan was, was borderline ridiculous, but then last week with the basketball game, and now this, it's, it's awful. Uh, this is not making me want to see them get in a wrestling ring whatsoever. Then we see Kyrie Sane has set up a celebration for Asuka, and of course... Nia Jax, thankfully, has to interrupt to save us from Kyrie's flute playing. Um, Nia says Asuka was handed the title and that she didn't earn it. Well, I have to disagree with that. She did earn it. Just no one else knew that the title was in the Money in the Bank briefcase. They were in the money in the bank. You know, Nia had just as good a chance as Asuka. She just didn't win it. And so she did earn it. But what I want to ask Nia is if you would have known that that belt was in the briefcase, are you saying you would have worked harder? Are you saying you would have done things differently? What exactly are, are you saying there? She, she did earn it by winning that match. However, I'm not sure how you can really call it a match. Asuka obviously gets tired of this and hits Nia with some blazing forearms and knocks her from the ring and then yells in Japanese at her. I still want that Japanese translator. I really would like to know what Asuka is saying. And then we get Charlie. She has found Baron Corbin. And asks him, you know, what what's going on. And Baron says that he has no doubts about the match. That he is the one that chose it. 
and says that Drew is prone to making mistakes and he has to take advantage of it when he does that, which is fairly true. Then we immediately go to a match of R-Truth versus Bobby Lashley. Now, I told you how ridiculous I thought Ruth or R Truth having his uh split personality was um in the last match that he did. Him continuing it and WWE allowing it just shows that it yes, it is stupidity. And this is how WWE is choosing to build the monster that is going to be taking on Drew McIntyre. That shows you where WWE creative level is. It's It shows you where their thinking is. Because our truth is starting out being pretty Ricky, who, you know, of course has his eyes crossed and the teeth in. And he just really needs to leave. And... As he continues doing it, my next thought is he really just needs to lose. Under normal circumstances, I would be rooting for our truth in this. I like our truth and everything, but since he has started this pretty Ricky garbage, I just want Lashley to pound him. So Lashley uh, gives me what I want. He slams him into the barricade and then into the ring post. And Lashley did not feed into our truth gimmick whatsoever. He didn't find it funny. He didn't even act like he noticed, which knowing Lashley probably didn't. But uh, Lashley got him into the full Nelson and then slammed our truth down on the mat and then got him back up in the full Nelson again. So our truth ended up tapping. So I think. That was great. And our truth coming up with this split personality and WWE allowing him to use it is just stupid. Um, this shows you the level that our truth will stoop to in order to get on TV. The best thing, however, of getting this match and seeing it and everything is we have crazy evil Lana Bach. She was watching the match and then started throwing things. And I'm telling you, MVP better watch this back because crazy evil Lana will not only shriek at him in his face, but it's hard to tell what she's plotting. Um, then we see Naya almost sneaking around w watching uh, Asuka and Kairi sing Celebrate. So... Is Naya a stalker now? Because I sure hope not. Unless um, Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross are facing the Iconics tonight like they did um, last week. The Iconics want an actual title match now. And I think with Bliss and Nikki Cross getting embarrassed almost last week they've decided to grant that so we're getting this match for you know the women's tag team championship now i told you guys last week in the episode that the iconics they did look better um but my question is can they do it again well yeah yeah they did this ended up not being a bad match at all. Now, it wasn't great. And it's really not that interesting. But it wasn't a bad match where I wanted to throw things at my TV. Um, both teams have really gotten better since this time last year. And it just shows you that they have been working hard. Now, Peyton Royce threw Alexa Bliss into the ring post too many times, so the referees disqualified the Iconics. Um, the thing that I want to kind of bring to your attention, 
have you guys been noticing that they're having a lot of disqualifications here recently? What's going on with that? I mean, the the Iconics got disqualified. Seth Rollins got disqualified against Rey Mysterio uh, in the tag team. We have had a lot of almost touchy disqualifications. You know, in the gauntlet match before Money in the Bank, Bobby Lashley got disqualified. It's It's been really weird. It's almost like someone on WWE Creative has remembered that and they're overusing it almost. Um, then we see Nia backstage slamming Kyrie into some production equipment. And I guess her flute playing was too much for Nia and I, while she was uh, stalking them, couldn't handle it. I, I don't know. But um, I guess she decided to make Kyrie pl- pay. And we're going to get Nia versus Asuka sooner or later. Then, of course, we see the Iconics arguing backstage, which to me was rare. I mean, they don't usually show that stuff. And then we see Billy Kay ends up slapping Peyton Royce in the face. And I was like, whoa, are are we getting an Iconics breakup? I mean, they've just been quarantined together, uh, you know, in Australia for a while. Um, are they going to break up like uh, a lot of... News reporters are saying that couples are breaking up because of being isolated and and in quarantine with each other. And then they look at each other and as they're crying and stuff, they hug. So I'm hoping that they don't they don't uh, break up or this causes problems between them because I kind of like them together. Well, then we see Kyrie saying in the trainer's room, and she's icing, and Asuka says she's going after Nia. So, we see Nia walking. And Asuka comes up to her and starts yelling in Japanese, and Nia continues to walk. Because to her, I'm sure that Asuka sounds like a little fly or bee buzzing around, and she's going where she's going. Asuka, however, doesn't like how she's being treated because she is the champion. And uh, Asuka pulls her hair and kicks her in the head. And I had to mark out for that because that's how you get somebody to pay attention to you. I bet Asuka uh, doesn't have to get... Naya's attention that way anymore, I bet Naya, you know, will start looking for Asuka. Then we get Natty versus Shayna Baszler in a submission-only match. I actually love that they did this match. Now, I saw a lot of people on Twitter and on the internet griping as this match was going on. That, hey, you know, it wasn't a match last week. I don't understand why they're doing this. This is crazy. But both of these wrestlers are known for their submissions. And I think that they have good chemistry. I think they're doing really well putting... Shayna and Natty because they get to show off. And I love that Shayna at one point looked at Natty and said, that heart dynasty stuff just doesn't work with real wrestlers. And she kind of proved it because Natty was trying to get her in the sharpshooter and Shayna countered it very easily into an ankle lock. And I was amazed at how they went back and forth. Now, at the end, of course, Shayna got her famous clutch on Natty and Natty tapped. But I enjoyed this moment. You know, Shayna rolls out of the ring and starts walking up the ramp while we see Natty 
kind of sit there and basically snap right before our eyes. Um, she is upset. She can't believe that she lost to Shayna. And I'm sure what Shayna said about, you know, she can't live up to the heart reputation and that Shayna basically beat her at her own game. And we see her basically just lose her mind. Uh, she starts throwing KO stuff out of the ring because the crew was coming in and trying to set up for the KO show. That's what's going to be next. And Natty is throwing the chairs and breaking him. She's throwing his signs. Uh, she's kicking at the mat that they're laying down. And, of course, Samoa Joe is saying her behavior is beneath her. Well, you know what? I would agree to a point. Natty, I'm sorry. I feel like it's a raw deal. She... WWE will use her as a trainer. They'll put her with younger wrestlers, have her guide them. So many wrestlers have thanked and said that without Natty, they wouldn't have been able to navigate the travel schedule and, and navigate publicity and all of that. Ronda Rousey definitely went out of their way to thank her. We have seen her on Total Divas and how she has dealt with the younger wrestlers and taken them under her wing and invited them into her family and everything. And for all that she does, I don't feel like they really push her. It's kind of like she's almost a borderline jobber. And maybe they're actually going to give her a storyline with this breaking point that she's finally reached. Well, it seems like everyone is snapping nowadays on Raw. I mean, we've had Seth Rollins, uh, we had Crazy Lana, we've had Natty. Well, now they show us backstage, and Selena Vegas Stable is fighting again this week. Um, and she tells them, you guys need to go out there like a cohesive unit. And she asks each, each one if they understand with authority. I mean... It looks like Vega could take each one of them on, even though they are bigger and stronger than her. But they kind of bow down to her and, and say yes. So since Natty's done destroying everything, we get the KO show. I am excited. Um, Kevin Owens is finally back from WrestleMania, and I'm excited. We need him back on this show. Maybe he will bring something to this show um he can't believe looking around the, the damage that natty has done to his set and he starts off by talking about getting his wrestlemania moment now he ended up getting injured from it and he talks about how he took some time off in order you know to heal that but he did get his WrestleMania moment, and I think that's awesome. Of course, then we hear uh, Angel Garza, Austin Theory, Andrade, and Zelina Vega come out. Um, as they're coming out, Kevin Owens gets out of the ring and steps on the ring apron. And Vega says to KO that, she believes that she's got a solid unit and asks him, why are you standing on the apron? And he says, and he's very honest, and I like this about Kevin Owens. He says, usually when I am in the ring with y'all, things start happening, and I didn't want that going on. Well, he's almost a prophet because here comes... Apollo Crews. He's flying out to attack Andrade, and they brawl Why? everyone is trying to pull them apart. 
you know, Garza and, and Theory and everybody is trying to get, you know, them apart. So, of course, we now have a tag match because that's how WWE Creative works. Is because they were on the KO show and Apollo interrupted, he needs a partner. So, yeah, KO can be his partner. So, we get Kevin Owens and Apollo Crews versus Angel Garza. And Andrade. Now, Zelina Vega and Austin Theory are obviously on the outside of the ring. And I don't understand why we're having this match. Um, I am questioning what WWE Creative has dreamed up for us to start believing. Because this was an absolutely awful, awful match. They had no chemistry. People acted like they didn't know what the other person was doing and where they should be going. Vega ended up distracting Apollo Crews so that Austin Theory could hit him. But Apollo knows Vega's tricks and he moves. So Austin ended up hitting Garza instead so, Apollo hits the sit-down powerbomb for the win. Well, I understand that they had this match for that particular move to happen. But I, I wish they would have thought up something else. Because this is almost like a Buddy Murphy moment. And... It's too close. It's like they write something that is decent and they use it over and over. and Kind of like they had Seth Rollins snap, so now they're having Natty snap. It's, I don't know. I just feel like WWE creative is lazy. So we get Austin Theory apologize immediately to Garza. But Vega and Andrade don't buy it. So, Andrade attacks Austin, and of course, they beat on him and then slam him into the barricade. Vega yells that she never should have believed in him and slaps him, and then Austin gets thrown over to near where the timekeeper's area is, and they walk off. Well, I think it's very funny when Andrade got hurt... And busted up his ribs. Vega believed in Austin enough. To put him in the Wrestlemania match. At 22 years old. And they had a really really good match. At Wrestlemania. But now all of a sudden. She believes in Garza over Theory. Come on. Um, anybody can see. That Austin Theory is going to be the next big thing. And Garza is not going to be able to polish his boots in about three years. Now, Drew says that he spent a lot of time with Baron Corbin. And he did because of them almost being a faction not too long ago. And Drew says that Baron is a terrible person. He said that he is having a great time, however, being a champion, and he's going to stay champion, and he has a Claymore fit for the king. I like Drew. I can't help but think that either Drew comes up with some of these lines, and he is really smart and witty, or whoever is writing for him does a good job. I mean, he he is always right on the ball. And so I'm I'm excited about seeing Drew. But of course, WWE has to ruin that by bringing the Street Profits versus the Viking Raiders. No, no, not in the ring cuz remember, we're doing the axe throwing contest. So we get the Viking Raiders showing off by throwing axes, hitting the bullseyes, 
and then they allow the street prophets to throw some axes and of course Dawkins completely misses the whole entire area and his first shot ends up hitting a barrel of beer and of course uh, Ford thinks that hilarious this is just going further and further downhill but anyway anyway um we get alistair black versus buddy murphy and of course seth rollins is back out there this is buddy murphy's second match of the night and he is acting a little tired we get alistair black taking over and um beating i don't know any other word i can't say he was hitting murphy he was beating on murphy um he his quick strikes were making murphy look really slow um so murphy rolled out of the ring and black follows him and actually kicks him into the barricade it's then we see that Austin Theory is still out there. He's near the ring, kind of towards the timekeeper's area, and Seth walks over and starts talking to him. Now, like I said, what story is this? This is the Buddy Murphy story. Remember three, four months ago, maybe six, Buddy Murphy was taking on Aleister Black. He lost the third match. He was over where the timekeeper's area was, and Seth Rollins went over to talk to him. Well, Seth Rollins is doing the same exact thing with Austin Theory. Um, Black is kicking Murphy and hits the ring post and actually kind of hits it hard with his foot so uh black gets ready to do the black mast and we see austin run in and start attacking alistair black theory and murphy attack black together because murphy is obviously disqualified and austin ends up hitting the atl and then he hugs or excuse me seth hugs him like he is welcoming him to the group now of course they flash to murphy a couple times and we see murphy a little frustrated a little confused wondering is theory going to be the new thing in the group uh you can see the doubt behind his eyes and it was really good uh of buddy murphy to kind of go through different emotions for us so that was a good segment and now we see the viking raiders and the street prophets again the viking raiders just absolutely kill the street prophets in the axe throwing contest which was a no-brainer However, the police show up and they have an axe in their windshield. It's just stuck there. What are the chances of that? But anyway, um, they want to know who has done that. And people kind of look at Dawkins and Dawkins says, oh, it wasn't me. And he throws an axe behind his back and hits the bullseye. Number one, I don't know many people that are professional axe throwers that can do that, let alone Dawkins. But, um, of course, then they show the Viking Raiders not believing this. So it's a turnabout on last week where the Viking Raiders showed that they could really play basketball in Dawkins. This week shows that he can really throw an axe. Yeah, it's totally unbelievable, stupid, and I cannot believe we're having to set through this so then we see apollo cruz challenge andrade to a title match next week vega comes out uh and agrees with apollo 
Oh, yay. Great. Good. Um, I'm not looking forward to that. I could care less. Can't believe it. Um, I don't want to see Apollo versus Andrade. I don't care who wins that one. I don't even care if Apollo Crews wins a belt. I, it, it's not going to be a good match. I couldn't care less. Um, they can have this one and not show it on TV as far as I'm concerned. But then we get Baron Corbin versus Drew McIntyre. And, of course, what they're doing is taking their number one person that everyone, it seems like, loves to hate in Baron Corbin and solidifying Drew McIntyre as a babyface, as if WrestleMania didn't do that when he was against Brock. But uh, we get them in the ring, and, of course, MVP and Bobby Lashley come out. We hear Lashley speak. He says that he's putting Drew on notice and that he's coming for the championship. Oh, good. Yay. There's Drew's next program. I was kind of hoping it was going to be against Baron Corbin because at least both of them can cut good promos. Obviously, they can't have a good match because this was definitely not a good match. They didn't appear to have a whole lot of chemistry in the ring or anything. Um, I did like that Drew did the axe handle from the top rope, and he has started the Glasgow kiss, and I enjoy that. Um, and then, of course, he hit the Claymore for the win over Baron Corbin. Afterwards, Drew tries to get Lashley to come into the ring, but we see MVP pointing at his wrist, telling him, yeah, it's it's not time yet. It's not time yet. So obviously MVP already has a little bit of control over Bobby Lashley. I kind of wish they would have let Lana come out and try to get Lashley to go to the ring, to take advantage of, of things and put him in the middle of this Pyre struggle between his wife and his new manager and, and everything. But, you know, WWE creative decided, I guess, they were out of time, uh, you know, because they had to show the Street Profits versus the Viking Raiders. Uh, yeah, total, complete chaos. This is raw at its worst. I absolutely can't believe that I sat here for three hours and watched this. However, you may disagree with me. You may have loved it. So, if you did, I need you to tell me that, hey, Sam, you're totally off base. I I love this. And I want you to tell me why. And I want you to be serious. Uh, because I don't believe you. I don't believe you for not one minute. So, uh, you guys hit me up on Wrestling Overtime on Twitter or Facebook. Or you guys write me at WrestlingOvertime at gmail.com and let me know what you think. Or better yet, give me some ideas that WWE can use to get Brawl better. Because this is almost getting to be... A dread on my Monday night schedule. It really, really is. It's, it's bad. Bad, bad, bad. Anyway, I will talk to you guys soon. Know that I am starting to work overtime for you.